I had a bit of a think about what we need to be doing as building services engineers in order to get to the sustainable cities of the future. Um, and obviously there's a lot of discussion about what we mean by a sustainable city. Um, and I won't really dwell on that because I think we've covered it a lot already. But for, for me as, a, as an engineer and for us as building services engineers, I think there's three key things that we need to think about. One is how we work. So sort of what sort of work are we doing? What's going to change in that? How are we adapting to the changing market we work in? Second is what we work on. So what type of projects? How is our job role going to change? And how are we going to work better within teams? And the third is where we work, both in terms of the global challenges, the UK, overseas, international presence, but also the context of the projects we work on. Are we looking at a building in isolation? Or are we looking at a bigger picture? So we need to kind of question what's routine now, how are we going to adapt to the changes that are coming at us, because we're on the cusp of fairly significant changes. There's zero carbon on the horizon, there's unprecedented climate change that we have to deal with, um, and all of this is presenting a change to the status quo in the way that we've done things for the last 20, 30, 50, 100 years. So thinking about the first bit, how we work, it's very much holistic design which I think has kind of been talked about already a few times, but blurring the boundaries between the disciplines. We go back a few years and you had a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, and a public health engineer. These days it's just building services. Well, in a few years' time, we'll probably have building designers or built environment designers, and that'll encompass architecture, it'll encompass financial analysis, and it'll encompass design and operation and facilities management. As we start to integrate all of the drivers that come from the clients, from government, from policy, and from the occupants of the buildings, because these are the people that are, are running the buildings, they're living in the buildings, they're working in the buildings. They're the ones that are going to drive what it is that we need to do. And they don't just think about the lights, the heating, the cooling, the bills. They think about the building as a whole and how that sits in their day-to-day -day life. And we need to adapt the way we work to match that. Similarly, we're going to be looking at handling new technologies, looking at resource balances, looking at circular economy, looking at closed loop systems, where we go beyond the conventional design a building, get it to work, give it to a client. We start to think about the end life of the building. We start to think about keeping energy and water within the building. So waste and um, wastewater recycling, looking at grey water, black water being integrated, looking at the connection between energy use and water use and recovering heat from wastewater streams to use in the input heating to the building. We've also got things like zero carbon, as I mentioned, but beyond that there's the idea of being net positive and how businesses and companies have an impact beyond that of their building stock and how we as engineers with an understanding of energy and of systems can help that. Then there's the less tangible measures. We're going to have to work in an environment where things like productivity and behaviour change and uh, financial driven decisions are becoming the norm. So we have to adapt the way we work to be able to respond to that. And we have to get used to handling embodied concepts like carbon and energy across the whole of the building, the whole of the life, and the idea of whole life costing to go with that. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the what, and that's very much the type of work we do. So a lot of what we're seeing now is about frameworks where clients want to work with companies they know on a regular basis. They want tangible experience. They want you to show that you've done this before. You've shown how that can be delivered. You know what all of this means. And you kind of need to be able to prove the capability, the experience you have as an engineer and give sort of diverse consideration to going beyond your kind of area of focus. So you may have a mechanical background, but you need to be talking about outreach and education, about well-being and health, understanding how mobility and transport can integrate into the energy strategy of a building and what happens about the ecology as a whole and the environment that the building sits in. Similarly, there's big issues in the what, in the sense of what kind of jobs are we doing? People have already mentioned a couple of times today about the idea of refurb and retrofit. We all know that most of our building stock of 2050 exists, and there's a huge amount that needs to be done with that. And I kind of, I like the point earlier about making this stuff sexy. There is definitely something in the need to make retrofit sexy. And I was at an event for the launch of Green Sky, and Th Green Sky Thinking last week where they were saying exactly that. There's an article in uh, Estates Gazette this week that talked about the fact that there's £29 billion of work in the UK commercial property just to get it up to an E-rating EPC, which it has to have by 2018. 
That's £29 billion of work to be done by building services engineers in the next four years. Now, if we can't make that a sexy concept and demonstrate a great business model to our clients, then we're doing something fundamentally wrong. The what also relates to context, because we're not just going to build a building. We're going to create an environment for people to live and work in that sits within a community. And there isn't a huge amount of space to go build anymore. So you're going to be building where something exists already, or you're going to be refurbishing, refurbishing something that exists already. So you've got to put it into the context of what's going around it. There's a lot more integration with networks, particularly if you're working in London, for example, you have to think about the heat networks. You have to think about what your uh, demands are for energy in relation to those of your neighbours. And I think we're going to see a lot more of sort of overlapping of adjacent um, buildings and sites and developments. If you um, are aware of what's going on in Vauxhall at the moment in Battersea, there's a huge heat network plan there. So every new development in the whole of the Vauxhall Nine Elms area connects to this same network. So they have to talk to one another. They have to be going for the same design standards. The similar corollary is that is the Olympic Park. Anybody who builds on there has to go with what's integrate, integrate with what's there already. Um, similarly, we've got to think about development in the sort of the political context, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about this earlier, but there's a lot of power vested in cities, and local governments like the GLA, like New York, like Vancouver, are doing amazing things by going two steps ahead of what the rest of the country is doing. And we've got to kind of engage that, yes, there is national policy, there's regulation, there's the uh, energy performance of buildings directive from the EU, but ultimately the biggest challenge for us at the moment is what's in the London plan. You try and build in London, your targets are way beyond those of the regulations. And understanding how we can work within that sort of political context, how we can better engage with the, the bodies that are making these decisions. Is it realistic? Are the GLA doing the right thing? Are we as an institution, as engineers, talking to them about that in the right manner? Are we engaging the public and the voters who are leading to these people getting into power in the way that we should? Similarly, there's a lot of opportunity to work with the, the local metropolitan bodies, so the local boroughs in London, the local councils around the rest of the country. Big businesses who want to be doing all of their buildings in the same way. You talk to a Tesco or a Marks and Spencers and they've got ideas that work on every single store or they have their plan A concepts. And that's been developed with building services engineers and it's about doing that kind of work with more and more clients because if you get the businesses on board, that happens across the whole company internationally. That will be every single building they're working in, every one of their staff and all that kind of stuff. And similarly, you get the smaller scale where the local communities are grouping together. And you get cooperative funding and you get small scale generation. And we need to know how to be able to talk the talk at all these different levels to say, this is what you need to do, this is how we can deliver it. The final thing is a bit about the where. And I've kind of touched on this a little bit with the context because that applies there too. But a lot of it is about moving beyond buildings and into the environments. So we're kind of seeing a limit now to what cities do in terms of growth. If London's going to go from 7 million to, uh, sorry, 7, yeah, 7 million to 9 million, that's not going to happen by expanding massively. That's going to happen within the greater London bounds that we already have. So how do we handle that increased demand within this fixed area? We've seen cities appear out of nowhere in the deserts in the Middle East, in the countryside in China. That kind of trend is coming to an end because it's just not sustainable. So we need to be thinking about how we can look at regeneration, how we can look at refurbishment and improvement within the in cities and the infrastructure that we have already and how the buildings and the built environment will deliver within those constraints. Similarly, we've got new ideas, or sorry, new, new iterations of old ideas. The Town and Country Planning Association are, are going back to the, uh, the original ideas of garden cities and garden suburbs. And these are ideas that were first postulated over a century ago. We're going beyond the sort of the crazy innovation, let's have a zero carbon city, into the where are the good ideas, how does this work, how can we deliver it? We're also seeing an increase in knowledge transfer. A um, big example of this is the Olympics legacy. The number of people I worked with on the Olympics who are now either out in Brazil, trying to make their Olympics sustainable, or out in Qatar, working towards the World Cup. There's a big, big transfer of what we've done and taking that overseas and sharing and sort of passing on the experience and the lessons learned. And that's something that we're going to see a lot more of because if we've got places like India and China who've got such a heavy reliance on coal, we need to support them and help them with what we've learned and be able to sort of drive the, the planet forward as a single entity rather than sort of London or UK or Europe. 
So I guess to close, I think the biggest, need, biggest thing we need to do as building services engineers is to question why we're doing the work we do and who is impacted by it. Because if the reasons for doing the work are good and the impacts are positive, then the work has value and that's where we want to be with a sustainable city. Thank you.